I want to dive right into scripture reading first. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, reading out the New International Version. Though I've read this in multiple versions, the New Living Translation is excellent as well. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Some of your translations say earthen vessels. I'll just say this, earthen vessels, jars of clay are fragile, chippable, and breakable. And that's really important. But what fills spills, that's going to be really important during this whole sermon series. But in these uh, earthen vessels, what fills us is what will spill from us. We've got to make sure what fills us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. The Greek word actually means hunted down. Where it says persecuted, the Greek actually means hunted down. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe, therefore we also speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to the overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Do you know the song by Hawk Nelson? It's been around, I think, since 2009 or so, titled Diamonds. Here's a line from it. And actually, it really captures the inspiration, some of the motivation for this new sermon series. When the pressure is on, he's making diamonds. He's refining, and in his timing, he's making diamonds out of dust, diamonds out of us. If you come up to someone and you say to them, what's going on in your life? I can't believe what you're going through. We need to get real quiet when that question's asked because I want you to think about it this way. God's making of diamonds in us is a sacred, precious, holy thing. Pressure can destroy us or we can allow it to shape us. God's making diamonds out of dust. And, and we need to see this process that's going on. We've all heard the phrase, I've heard the phrase multiple times, Jeff, you need to trust the process. You've heard me say that. And I would say, you know, the process is killing me. Yeah, it might be, but it's also shaping me. And if we embrace what God is trying to do in our lives through the outside pressures, it becomes a precious, holy, sacred thing, almost a a reverence because we know what God's plan really is. And and so even the logo of this series, the, the diamond with the crown, I want you to really keep that picture in your pressure. He's making diamonds out of us. He's making diamonds out of dust and he's going to crown us with righteousness. Now in this morning's message, we're going to be considering a relational aspect of the pressures that reveal Jesus and form us into his likeness. I've never preached this message. I've absolutely never preached this message in the way that I'm gonna be doing it. This is brand new for me, and I could not preach this until I knew that I was experiencing it and had the courage to actually share it. I hope, in a way, it rattles some of our cages, because cages are prisons. And if I can shake the cages enough and rattle them enough, maybe, maybe the locks will open and we can walk out of these prisons that we live in sometimes. And hopefully you understand what I mean by that in a minute. I, this message has rattled my cage. It rattled it long enough to open up the door so I could step out of a prison that I was in. Pressure and death 
death-like suffering happens. And I want you to think of this phrase, death-like suffering, because when I speak of death and dying this morning, I'm really talking about death-like suffering. You know that suffering that feels like it's going to kill you? And in some ways it is. What you need to let happen is all that suffering kill the right thing. Not kill you, kill the sinful things. Kill the carnal things. Uh, You know, mortify those things which keep you away from Jesus. That thing that you hold for so long that really was light when it came into your life, but you've held it so long as no one mentioned, it's now become a great weight and it's weighing you down and it's hindering your growth. And it's actually keeping that diamond from being Form. Now, a diamond begins with a speck of dust. That's you. But then the diamond around it is what forms. Pressure and death like suffering happens. No one wants distress, perplexity, or persecution. But these are the things that release the sweetest aromas of Christ. I, I was going to use this as an illustration, but it won't work because I was wrong about what it was. Anyone ever drank apple cider vinegar with the, with the mother? And I thought, you know what? If you could squeeze apples and get mom out of it, that's pressure. But then I read about it. You know what the mother is. Probably, you know, Hillary knows what the mother is because she's one of those kind of eaters, drinkers. But, you know, so you you get apple juice and then uh, you ferment it to alcohol. And then you add an enzyme so that it turns into acetic acid. And that bacteria is what does that. And the mother is that bacteria. I thought the mother was the pulp or something. I mean, if there's mom in there, that is really squeezing to get mom out of that. But that's not what it is, so I can't use that illustration. But I do want you to turn, I do want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 14 through 17. Read this before, but never in this context. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God. You're going to go back and look at that side and go, where's mom? I don't see mom. Oh, there's my mom. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us as his captives to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. We're his incense. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to the task? And like so many, we do not peddle the words of God for profit, on the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity. Hallelujah. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. But who is equal to the task? You're not equal to the task until pressure is applied to that which is not Christ is is purged from you uh, until the, the, the mother appears. I don't know. But the point is, it's only in our pressure that the pleasing aroma of Christ is made possible. And, and that's a life-giving aroma. A few months ago, uh, well, then I want to read something else too. Paul explains the relational importance of suffering. We're still in 2 Corinthians. Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Paul explains the relational importance of suffering. And the big quote here is, God comforts us so we can comfort others. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. Let me expand how Paul addresses this in verse 3 in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. The Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we comfort ourselves, that comfort we receive from God. For just as we share the abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, if you're distressed this morning, I want you to think about this. This is the message I've never preached before. If we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. Thank you very much. If, if we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. This is a sacred thing. This is what I'm saying. This is a sacred, precious, holy thing, this process. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. And it's very interesting, Paul's letters, in both Corinthian letters and the one that we don't have, there was a third one, Paul alludes to that. Paul's having to defend his struggles. Paul's having to defend his suffering. Have you ever felt that way before? He shouldn't have to defend it, but we don't understand trouble. We assume because someone's in trouble, because someone's suffering, they must have done something to cause it. That's not true at all. Or maybe you did do something to cause it. You were trying to follow Jesus and it brought you trouble. That happens a lot. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Isn't that what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Who can do this? It's beyond our ability to endure. Can anyone relate? Anyone said, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. Well, Paul can relate so that we despaired of life itself. I know some of us in this room have been there before. And maybe you're there right now. Indeed, we felt we have received the sentence of death. Some have probably felt that way, or you know someone who has. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. But this has happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. God. That's why this is such a sacred, precious, holy thing, this pressure that we're talking about today, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. It's a couple of months ago, I can't exactly remember the context, but I, this question came to me. Do you have an interpersonal relationship with Christ? Have you ever been asked that, anyone ever been asked that question? I'd never been asked that question. I hadn't even considered that question. Look in your notes. A few months ago, I was challenged by a question that I'd never heard before. Do you have an interpersonal relationship with Christ? Now, the way they define interpersonal relationships with Christ is really important. Interpersonal relationships are relationships with others through Jesus. So an interpersonal relationship is I have a relationship with Jesus, you have a relationship with Jesus, because of that shared relationship, I then have a relationship with you. Do you have an interpersonal relationship with Jesus? And what happened was, is I'm contemplating this question you just have to trust me on this. The Holy Ghost spoke to me very plainly. He said in 2022, the answers to that question are going to become very, very important. Now, I can make predictions why the answer to that question can become important, but I'm just saying the Holy Spirit himself said to me, I heard him in my head. You know how you hear God speak in your head? I mean, we all hear voices, but I heard this voice. The Holy Spirit said the answers, and he said answers, not answer. The answers to this question, do you have an interpersonal relationship with Jesus? It's going to become very, very important, which means... We have to have a relationship with Jesus, but those that have relationships with Jesus, we need to be related to them. Follow along. I'm sure you've heard this question. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? This is how I was taught as a Christian to be an evangelist when I was a navigator and, and doing this crazy thing of walking through dorms and knocking on doors, not knowing who's going to be behind the door. And then sharing the four spiritual laws or the bridge illustration. We actually did that in those days, not very successfully, but that's what good Christians were supposed to do. In, in those days, I guess I was a good Christian. I failed miserably, but I was a good Christian failing, I suppose. And it's an important question because a relationship with Jesus has to be personal. Uh, I, I was just describing someone the other day. I want you to understand what's going on in this person I was talking about. This person is going to do everything within his or her power. I'm not letting anybody figure out who this is. This person is going to do everything within his or her power to make sure that when they come to their faith, they own it and it's not anything that you gave them. Because it has to be personal. Some of you know the struggle of that as you uh, got older and you uh, moved from home and you developed your own personal relationship with Christ. You had a relationship with Christ that wasn't interpersonal. It was just through your parents or through your pastor or through your youth leader. And then you had to realize this has to become mine. And so it's an important question. However, to our detriment, 
and this is a rhetorical question in my opinion, and I think you're all going to answer it the same way I would. However, to our detriment, is it possible society's focus on individual rights and happiness, preaching to felt needs, which is what a lot of we preachers get when we go to seminars, how to do that, it's preaching to needs rather than to preaching about Jesus to address the needs, or Christian consumerism, which is rampant around us, have caused us to overlook or neglect the importance of having an interpersonal relationship with Jesus. We come to church for what I can get. Instead of coming to church and getting what I need so that I can bless others with it. And Paul makes this very plain. The comfort that I am receiving from Jesus as I'm dying is going to be able to make it possible for me to give you comfort. That's the relationship. That's how interpersonal relationships work. And maybe you've heard of this recent book by Carl Truman, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Anyone heard this book? Go on YouTube. Yeah, I, we had talked about that, hadn't we, Brad? It, it was impacting, wasn't it? Okay, it's impacting. Go online, listen to interviews, find the PDF or go buy it. The Rise and Triumph and this is not a compliment to the modern self, the rise and triumph of the modern self. The second part of that de uh, title is cultural amnesia, expressive individualism, and the road to sexual revolution. And in that book he just describes, and it's really a, a read worth reading, or at least uh, the Colson Center did interviews with him. It'd be worth, I've got pastor friends of mine that are going through book studies, group studies online on this book. It really describes to our detriment how, how individualism is just destroying society, not just the church. Individualism is destroying the family. Individualism is destroying education. And he really documents this. He's a, a, a theology professor. But I want you to notice something. Have you noticed that expressions for Christ followers refer to collections of people? I know I'm a disciple, singular. I know I'm a Christian, singular. But listen to the expressions for Christ followers. Translated, the word church means a called out single? No. Translated, ecclesia means a called out assembly. It's a group called out of another group. That's what the word church means. It, I know we're disciple, I'm a disciple, but I'm, I'm supposed to be grouped with another group of disciples, a called out assembly. Look at these other words. We're also called the body of Christ. A body is made of many parts. Notice how it's a collection. The church is described as a family. The church is described or followers of Christ as the household of faith. A household means more than one member. A fellowship, Noah did this well in describing this, a fellowship. The word communion literally means things in common with others. The fellowship of his suffering, the, the, what I have in common with Christ's suffering. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he wanted to be conformable, conformable to the fellowship the community of Christ's suffering. This is a really important topic. And then group, Christian followers are also just known as community. So being a Christian means having a personal relationship with Christ, but fully experiencing growth. And the rich benefits of a personal relationship with Jesus includes having interpersonal relationships through Jesus. Said simply, Hebrews 10.25 it is so silly for preachers only to quote this verse when church attendance drops. That's not what Paul is talking about, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews. But said simply, the value of interpersonal relationships is this. Christians need each other and all the more as we see the day approaching. If you can't see that day approaching, seriously, <sighs> get glasses. Just <laughs> Christians need each other and all the more as we see the day of Christ appearing, approaching. Now I want you to reflect on the interpersonal aspect of this statement. Some of you have heard it before. God is always at work around us to do his work in us so that he can work through us for the benefit of others. Anyone ever heard a statement similar to that? God is always work around us to do his work in us in us so that he can do his work through us for the benefit of others. It begins with Jesus. Jesus' life was this, the prayer in John 17. Uh, you know, Jesus is basically saying, Father, I've completed the work that you gave me. 
And, and that work that God had given him is what took him to the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see the outworking of this now. He's trying to pray in the presence of the disciples. So God's work around him is now being finalized within him. That is, am I, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to bear the, the sins and the, the burdens of every man, the, the, the fall of this creation, past, present, and future. So what God is trying to do around him, God is working within him so they can complete his work through him for the benefit of us. And understand what God is doing right now in your life, and it's a precious thing. I've already said he's forming a diamond. He's taking what's going on around you right now. Just embrace it. Pressures are going to come. Just decide how you want to die. <laughs> right? Just to choose your heart. Uh, choose to do it your way or let God just have his way with you and form a diamond. And so God's working around you to work in you to do, so that he can do his work through you for the benefit of others. Now, this is not profound, but 2022 promises to be another year of, is this a word, non-normals? I think it's going to be a word because it's just everything's non-normal. 2022 promises to be a world, a new world of non-normals, new challenges and new difficulties. Now, I don't know, any New Year's resolution people here, you really do those? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't meet many people that do. I went and, and to Planet Fitness today, and there was two people there I'd never seen before, brand new members, you could tell. They clearly had made a new resolution to exercise. I won't see them by Thursday. So I didn't even take time to learn their names. You know, yeah, we'll see you next year for two days, right? But if you are a New Year's resolution person, uh, I really think you just need to live a, live a resolved life. I'm so grateful for those who discipled me in the spiritual practices and the spiritual disciplines. They just taught me, hey, do it every day whether you want to or not. It will help you. This is good for you. Eat it. That's what my dad used to say. So anyway, but if you are a New Year's resolution person, let me just urge you not to be this year. This is what Dr. Sophie Lazarus, she works for Ohio State Medical Center, said this. You might be better off not making any this year. After two years of a pandemic that has no end in sight, many of us are burnt out and exhausted. Trying to improve ourselves in this new year feels daunting. According to Dr. Lazarus, after a pressure-packed, difficult year, the last thing to do is add more pressure to yourself by setting goals that might not be realistic during a global pandemic, a new year of non-normal. So what do we do? Well, you know what you do? You always go to the Word. That's what you do. The word has a helpful perspective for difficulties and pressures. Did you notice what we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18? I've got it here if you didn't turn there. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. That's a good perspective, isn't it? These non-normals, they're temporary. They won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that far outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Here's the picture. The word glory in Hebrew is kabod. There's a kabod house here. Rabbi Zalman's a dear friend of mine. He's with the kabod movement. But the word kabod, glory, means weight. So here's the picture. You've seen the scale. So you've got pressures, you're holding that mic for, you know, six weeks, and, and it, it gets heavy, it gets heavy, it gets heavy, but guess what? The glory of God outweighs them all. And that's what the word glory means, weight. Regardless of whatever pressure's weighting you down, the glory of God tips the scale, always. So understand what's going on right now. As all these afflictions are coming, the glory of God is heavier than anything you're carrying. You're not getting excited, that's okay. I guess it's cold and you didn't. But Sarah, the glory of God outweighs every single affliction. We've gotta to learn to live that. Like I said, this is a precious, sacred, holy thing as he makes diamonds out of us. Remember in our suffering, God comforts and purifies. I've already read 2 Corinthians 1, 5 through 7. You're surely familiar with 1 Corinthians 3, where it says there's coming a day where fire was going to test us to see what we're made of. 
You remember that? We've read it before. That this time when we as believers appear before the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. Christians are, are judged in a different way. But our lives are going to come before Jesus, and it's going to reveal what we're really made of. And honestly, please understand this. Right now, God's goal is to burn away from you the wood, hay, stubble, and dross now. We were watching Mountain Men last night. It shows how bored we were. On New Year's Eve, the football games were over, and they were putting massive uh, shovelfuls from a, an inloader to try to find an ounce of gold. And, and so what God wants to do is burn all the dross out of your life to reveal the gold, the precious jewels, and the diamonds, and let him do that now so there's no loss when you finally come before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what he's doing right now. He's trying to burn away the dross. You know, it's like God is looking at you and goes, there's a diamond in here somewhere. We're diamonds in the rough right now, right? But there's a diamond in there somewhere. And to bring the brilliance out of that, he's got to cut away things, even a part of this diamond, to bring the brilliance to it. And, and so we just embrace that. Like I said, this is a precious, precious, holy thing, what God is doing. Diamonds crowned with righteousness. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. I want to emphasize the inter interrelational aspects of what Paul's talking about. I've underlined them. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves, here's the interpersonal relationship part, but not but we, and, and we preach, for we preach not ourselves, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. That's interpersonal relationship. Then next verse, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that this life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, interrelational part, so that death is at work in us, but life is at work also in you. Do you see the interpersonal relationship here? We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with who? You, with himself, interpersonal relationship. And all of this is for your benefit. That's interpersonal relationship. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And if I need to explain it, that's what this next paragraph is. Paul is talking about death-like suffering, these things that are killing us. Their suffering was bringing death to their egotistic, self-absorbed, self-glorifying, carnal, mortal natures, trying to kill the triumphant modern self. God right now wants to kill the triumphant modern self. It's really important, and it's a sacred process. Their dying was revealing the life of Jesus. And this, the word dying, sometimes I put it in quotes, sometimes I put it in italics, just to emphasize what I'm talking about is death-like suffering, your hardship, your hard times. These things that reveal to you who you really are. Uh, we're going to start the life, the salt trainings. Uh, Rocky and Luann are going to be doing those, I think, on Wednesday nights. And one of the big messages in salt is you are not God. And you're going to find out how many times you think you are, you want to be, and you could be, and you should be. And, and so you, when, you, when those are shown to you, you die. There's part of you that just dies. And, and, you know, Rocky watched me bleed and die all over the table. You'll see the scars and everything, the, the flesh that's left behind on the table in room C1, what Rocky put me through. A lot of dead Jeff in room C1, I'm just saying. And it was delightful. It was delightful. Didn't need that garbage anyway. Amen? Amen. Amen. Their dying was revealing the life of Jesus. Paul says in living under pressure, the life of Jesus becomes more visible. That's how we get the aroma of Christ, remember? Remember? They lived in the face of death. 
their perplexities, distresses, and pressures revealing eternal life to the people around them. An irony of God's economy. This is an irony of God's economy. I'm, not, I'm really talking about an exchange. That's what economy means, an exchange of something for something else. The irony of God's economy was as their bodies may have been dying, quote unquote, their spirits being renewed day by day. That's how God does business. That's how God does business. As you're dying, your spirit is being renewed. That's the exchange. And you're getting something far more valuable for whatever you're spending. Amen? Amen. Now, I really hope the stepping stone, I, I don't, it's hard for me to describe it. I've never preached this before. I'm just hoping that what I think is a stepping stone and then reciprocating logic. So you move forward, but it reciprocates back. You, you, you move forward in death, but it reciprocates back in life. Is a word picture, I hope I can, I'm trying to make this word picture. I hope the stepping stone reciprocating logic of all this dying is not escaping us. Do you see the give and take that happens when people are in an interpersonal relationship with Jesus? If everyone is dying, follow this, please. Oh God, help me express this. If everyone is dying to the life of self, thereby revealing the life of Jesus, then everyone will be sharing in the life of Jesus together. If you're dying and I'm dying, we're all sharing life. That makes sense? I hope it does. I'm gonna keep trying here. As I am dying, and sometimes some Sunday mornings, you ever watch me? He's dying up there, isn't he? Hopefully it's giving you comfort. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't know. That may be, I better stop there. But as I'm dying, I'm revealing the life of Jesus to you. And as you are dying, you're revealing the life of Jesus to me. I think we need to be around dying people more. I do. You're dying, sorry, thank you very much, is vital to me. And my dying, thank you very much, is vital to you. As I die, you live. As you die, I live. Are you feeling it? Are you sensing it? I hope so. In this way, everyone, in my dying, in your dying, everyone gets more and more of Jesus all the time. And speaking eternally then, everybody lives. Whew. Never preached this before. I think it's a really important lesson. And if Jesus was trying to make it plain to me a couple of months ago that in 2022, having an interpersonal relationship with Jesus become even more important than ever before. We just need to lock into this. Think about it. In a connected Christian community, there, this will be a common experience. I've said it, I've said it from the pulpit, you've said it to me. Think about this. Someone is going through a hard time and they're not folding. They're dying, but they're not folding. We know that, per you know that person right now? I know a lot of those people in this church right now. You're going through hell. I mean, literally hell, and it's not fair. And you need to stop me when I say that. Say, no, pastor, this is precious. This is holy, and this is sacred, if we understand it correctly. But you've all experienced this. Someone's going through a hard time and not folding. In their suffering, they are glorifying Jesus. And when you go to visit them to encourage them, tell me what happens. You leave what? Encouraged and glorifying Jesus. And Jesus is more revealed in your body. I can't, I can't tell you how many times, you know, Reverend Barclay has walked into the hospital, walked into the room to be an encouragement. And I walk away thinking, wow, I needed that visit more than they did. That's interpersonal relationship with Jesus. How many times have you gone to encourage a suffering person and you are the one encouraged? We're gonna give some for instances and I'm wrapping up. I recently read about 2,000 Afghan Christians and the article that I read said there's only 2,000 native Afghan Christians. I don't know how they counted. I don't, I don't think that's an inflated number. I'd like to think that there's more, but they said there's 2,000 Afghan Christians, and this is what they have done. They have voluntarily added Christian to their national ID card. The Taliban comes to their house and says, now we know who you are, and they're marked. And they know that they could be taken, they could be killed at any time. And here's why, this, I, read the, I read the interview, this is why these 2,000 Afghan Christians have voluntarily taken Christian and added it to their ID card. They said, we're suffering. 
and we know that we may die because of this, but we're taking this on our ID card so the next generation can live. And you need to understand what I mean by dying and living. Do you understand what I, the spiritual aspect of that? We know that this may be certain death for us, but we truly believe that in our potential suffering, this will help the next generation live as Christians. That's why this is a hard message to preach because there's cost involved. I try to give some other examples because I don't want to leave anybody's trouble out. <laughs> the stories of death-like Christian suffering are also being experienced in Cuba. And I have relationships and friendships with some of those people there. I know John Armstrong has deep, intimate relationships. Noel and I have deep, intimate relationships with them. And every time I read about their suffering, I get encouraged. How does that work? How do I get comfort from their suffering? But that's how it works. You know what? You're feeling it now, I hope. Uh, in Cuba or Turkey, uh, you know, Sarah Taylor Barkley, Noah's wife's brothers in Turkey. There's not overt, terrible oppression, but there's surveillance nonstop. And, and I, every time I talk to David, and Bethy tries calling him sometimes in Turkey. She has the number memorized, don't you, Beth? You're looking, no, you don't, not anymore. Okay, she used to in Turkey. And, and every time I hear about what he's going through and the courage, and they just lost a partner in ministry uh, there during COVID, not to COVID, but uh, Joel died of cancer. And they kept on keeping on, and I got encouraged. I've got other examples, obviously North Korea, Nigeria. I mean, people went into churches on Christmas Day in Nigeria and just murdered the pastors and murdered church members and killed the deacons and burnt the building. Iran and China, those are difficult to hear. And a little bit closer to home, we, we don't really pay attention like we ought to, but Topeka is, is in a mess on the east side. I mean, terrible gang violence. And when I read what the churches are doing in Topeka to try to keep pressing on and to, and to father fatherless children and to help single moms, it, it just encourages me in their suffering and, and folks, there's parts of Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas, they're just absolute war zones. And we live a little bit immune from that. But when I read about how Christians are, are dealing with those things, I'm encouraged in their suffering. We may not be experiencing here, but it's only, you know, 20 minutes that way and 30 minutes that way where people are living very difficult, dangerous times. And innocent people are suffering because of the stupidity of violent people. And when I see how churches are trying to respond, the Macedonian Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri, my gracious sakes, I go to seminars there and I sit there with their pastors and the things they're doing to try to overcome the violence and the, and the, the terrible things that are happening to innocent people, I just get encouraged. But when we read how Christians going through these things are responding, they're dying, becomes life-giving and Jesus-revealing. This is why in our suffering, I have emphasized this for a long, long time. I'm going to keep emphasizing it. This is why in our suffering, we need to know others and be known by others. I've urged everyone to have this level of intimacy with some people in this church, that there are people in this church that you trust enough, that you love enough, that they know you love them and you can be vulnerable enough, that they're the person that you would allow hands to be laid on you for prayer. If you don't have someone like that, you need to, this isn't speed dating to develop this kind of relationship. You don't speed date to get this. It takes time and it takes vulnerability. And I want to go right to the sermon to life. For instance, while in Illinois, and we were there until Wednesday night, and we left after church last Sunday, I had two phone conversations and there could have been more that illustrated this sermon. And actually it confirmed why I think this sermon is so important this morning. I took them as confirmations that today's message would be timely. Both times. Now I talked to the people that were suffering too, but I took two phone calls from people that were calling me to tell me, and I don't normally get these kind of phone calls, they were calling me to tell me how they'd been encouraged as they talked to someone who in our church who was suffering. Wow, that's the message, Lord. He goes, yeah, I told you, interpersonal relationship. I took them as confirmations that today's message would be timely. Both times the callers described how the suffering of another person had revealed Jesus to them. Now, the only reason this happened was because they know them, and they knew them. And again, this isn't speed dating. 
encouraging and urging them to press on through their lesser sufferings because that's what they realized. Wow, compared to them, my sufferings are lesser. I'm encouraged by them. Nobody wants to go through these stresses. Nobody wants to go through these duresses. Nobody wants to live a perplexed life. But look what happens when we're in relationship with others because of it. The mutual benefits of suffering only happen when we live close. And I could insert, when we live close to dying people, quote unquote. As the intensities of life increase, and this is what I think the Lord was speaking to me earlier with this idea of interpersonal relationship. As the intensities of life increase, the necessity of interpersonal relationship with Christ are also intensified. And that's what it says in Hebrews 10, 25. Christians need each other and all the more when as we see the day approaching. And this is the Sermon to Life section and please hear this, please hear this. Satan's tactics of fear, distrust, division, polarization, loneliness and social exclusion are effective. I think we all know that. Social isolation is being shown to have awful consequences on people's physical, spiritual, and mental health. And we have practitioners in this building that can confirm that is true. And it was predicted even when all the quarantines and shutdowns began. Now, I don't know what the alternative to that was because we want everyone to be safe, but it's being proven now that that has been detrimental to people's health, mental, physical, and spiritual health. About three years ago, I talked about a book that I still think you all need to read. It's by Dan White. It's called Love Over Fear. Anyone heard of this book? Know who Dan White is? The first time I heard him interviewed about this book, Love Over Fear, here's what he said. He said, if you're trying to decide, some of you remember this now, if you're trying to decide whether or not I am a conservative, progressive, or liberal, you need to read this book. Because if you're a conservative and you th decide he's a liberal, you're not going to read that book because you're afraid. That's what he said. And if you're a, a, more of a progressive Christian, whatever we want to call that, and, and you think he's one of those conservative Christians, I'm not going to read that book. He said, if you, and, and I couldn't guess because I tried, because I want to know if I want to read that book. I, wow, wow, he's right. That's why I knew I needed to read that book. And I don't have it referenced here, but it's Dan White, Love Over Fear. Because in that book, he talks about terror management theory. Remember that phrase I used about three years ago, started using it? So a group of psychologists were trying to do a study on how, how we get polarized, how we get separate, how divisions form. And they saw how groups will use certain words to create fear of another group. And, and political parties use it. They're specialized in that. They actually have the book from these psychologists. Political parties use it. Terror management theory. But Christians do it too. When you listen to a prophecy teacher and he's trying to create a little bit of fear and distrust of those who don't see the end times. Anyone talk, read prophecy like that? There's, there's prophecy teachers that actually have branded themselves to create fear in you for someone else. Okay, I'm just going to rattle cages. If when someone's talking, I'm just going to rattle a cage here. If someone's talking and you're trying to think, are they anti-mask or pro-mask? Are they anti-vax or pro-vax? And if you're trying to make a decision about them before you decide to be in relationships with them, you are afraid. The gospel overcomes fear. And only through that can we have the interpersonal relationships that we're going to desperately need in the times coming. Again, I hope that rattled the cage enough that some of us were able to walk out free. Satan's tactics of fear, distrust, division, polarization, loneliness, and social exclusion are effective. Social isolation is having terrible consequences. Satan's tactics of fear, distrust, and isolation result in a dying that leads to death, not living. There's a dying that I've talked about already that leads to life. Do you see the difference? This is really important too, and I'm closing. Too often, when we suffer, we retreat and we pull away, don't we? Come on. When we suffer, we retreat and we pull away. We overcome this tendency with honesty and vulnerability. 
Every time we go back to Illinois and we visit Cindy's sister, I go with my brother-in-law to his AA meetings. He's a retired colonel from the Air Force. He flew transport planes, big ones. He flew the, the refuelers, uh, decorated, uh, flew, you know, fueled jets in combat, flew when he was being targeted by missiles. He became an alcoholic. And, and I go to A meetings with him where the, the honesty and the transparency and the liberty are so pronounced, I get encouraged. It almost makes me want to, you know, get drunk, you know, become a drunk for just a little while so I can experience the liberty. I mean, that's how powerful their vulnerability and honesty is. And I'm joking, by the way. Living this way is complicated and risky. There was a new guy there when I was there Monday night, Monday afternoon at noon, a new guy there. And, but you could tell they'd all been where he is, wanting to go back and drink. And they just told him that. I thought, you can't tell him that. That's what we don't do at church. We don't tell him that. You want to go back and sin, don't you? I've never said that. But by saying that, it just pulled the the cover off of them. It just did. Living this way is complicated and risky. When trusted interpersonal relationships don't exist, living this way is doubly complicated. Because it's hard even when there's a trusted relationship. And I'm closing. But someone needs to hear this this morning. It's the bottom of the page. Say no thanks to the risk of close relationships wrongly assumes that avoiding relational risk is the path to safety and self-preservation. That is a lie. Because it's the devil that isolates. It's the devil that isolates. It, it just is. And, and his tactic's working right now. The church is divided. Our nation's divided. We're all polarized. You know, like Dan White said, if you're trying to figure out whether or not I'm a conservative, progressive, or liberal before you read my book, you need to read my book. And I needed to read his book. I still can't figure it out. Because he spoke truth. He spoke truth. That's really important right now. Because we are surrounded by lies. And with that, we're surrounded by distress where no life is coming from it. But if we'll surround ourselves with Jesus and be surrounded in Jesus... And just decide right here this morning that what's going on around us is God at work in us so that he can work through us for the benefit of others. Wow, what a 2022 year we could have as a body of Christ. So as we go through this series on pressure, I'm going to be you know, restating interpersonal relationships. I'm going to show a very transparent video of, of uh, uh, Elizabeth Masson. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Liz Masson, yeah, that is going to whew, Liz Groundwater. Uh, did you share it with others already, Lisa? Okay, Liz gave me permission to share it, and I don't know if she'll be here, but we'll show it next week, and you don't want to miss this. It is so liberating in, 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 in the difficulty of it. And uh, I got so comforted by, you know, what she went through. And some of you are going through things right now, and believe it or not, as I'm watching you, as your friend, as your pastor, I'm getting comfort from that. That's a good thing. And it's a necessary thing. It's called, it's called the body of Christ. Can we pray? If you want special prayer in this, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, I'd be honored to do that. But, but I want you to really think about what's going on around you right now and realize that as he's working his comfort in you, it's actually bringing comfort and encouragement to others. But we've got to be in relationship for it to be fully manifest. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Do you guys have a song that ministers to that? Okay. Well, let's just sing this. Let's stand, and then we'll, we'll dismiss. But I'll pray with anyone that would like prayer today.